Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I am Dibar Ghesanyal and here are the top stories for the day. As expected, the GDP growth slowed down to 4.4% in the third quarter of financial year 2023. While releasing the figures, the government said that the GDP is estimated to grow at 7% during 2022-2023 against 9.1% in 2021 What else do the government figures say? And what do they mean? What led to this slowdown? And what does the road ahead look like? Raghav Agarwal and Bhashwar Kumar crunch the numbers and talk to experts to find the answers. The Indian economy grew at 4.4% between October and December 2022 or Q3 FY23. This is what the second advance estimates released by the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation on Tuesday showed. According to earlier estimates in Q3 FY22, the economy grew at 5.4%, and in Q2 FY23, GDP growth was recorded at 6.3%. In the current financial year, India's gross domestic product is expected to grow at 7%. In the first advance estimates released in January 2, Mosby had estimated GDP growth in FY23 at 7%, marginally higher than projections by the Reserve Bank of India and World Bank at 6.8% and 6.9%. However, the estimates for FY22 have been revised upwards to 9.1% from 8.8%. The growth in nominal GDP at the current price during FY23 is estimated at 15.9% as compared to 18.4% in FY22. In a survey based on 41 professional forecasters, the RBI earlier this month pegged the GDP growth forecast for the third quarter at 4.6% with a range of 4 to 6.9%. However, RBI had projected the real GDP growth for FY23 at 6.8% with the third quarter and fourth quarter growth at 4.4% and 4.2%. So what's behind the slowdown in the GDP growth rate in Q3? Well, the GDP number for Q3 of FI23 did come in below our expectations. We had uh, anticipated that there will be a sequential slowdown between Q2 and Q3 because of a base effect uh, related to the recovery that had taken place last year. But having said that, the number is certainly uh, lower than what we had expected. And part of it is coming uh, on account of a consumption uh, trend, which is uh, certainly surprising to us. Uh, it is belying the uh, recovery in uh, consumption of services that we're seeing across the board. Uh, so we're uh, surprised on that account. And also when we look at the GVA side, which is the production side, uh, the one area that stood out uh, coming in weaker than our expectations was public administration, defense and other services. Given the trends that we saw in the revenue expenditure growth of government of India and the state governments, so actually, the, the uh, Q3 GDP growth number does not come as a surprise. So we were looking at a number of around 4.6%. RBI had 4.4%. So I think we have come broadly in this particular range of 44 to 4.6%. The reason I say it's not really as surprising is that because uh, it has to be looked at in the context of what is the overall GDP growth number for the entire year. So here for this particular year, the NSO is talking of 7%. RBI had 6.8%. We had Bank of Baroda also had 6.8%. So with this number of 4 4.4%, we seem to be well poised to attain this number of 6.8% to 7% for the entire year. Now, why is this happening? One is, of course, there is a, an inherent slowdown, which we are seeing, especially in the pace of uh, consumption, as well as capital formation, that is more on the demand side. And there's, of course, a statistical base effect, which is also there, where last year we saw a kind of a bump up in terms of the growth numbers, primarily on account of the negative number which we had in the previous year, that is 2021. So that is a kind of a minor correction which is taking place. Also, will the slowdown continue in Q4 too? 
so for q4 of uh, fy23 we are currently expecting gdp growth to be between 4.5 to 5% so in sequential terms that might be a slight uptick as compared to what uh, we've seen in the previous quarter but i want to just qualify this by saying that when we uh, look at the yoy growths there's a lot of base effects which are caked in and if we actually compare q3 of fy23 with the pre covid quarter then there is an improvement in the growth as compared to the same metric for q2 so it's a slowdown on a yoy basis but it's actually an improvement uh, relative to uh, the pre covid quarter and uh, you know there our view is that uh, looking at the pre covid comparison may actually be more meaningful See, we do expect the slowdown to continue in the Q4 numbers because I think whatever pent-up demand we saw in the first three quarters would have been exhausted. And I say it would have been exhausted because we don't have the occasion, we don't have the festival season, something which kept it up. And second, we have had relentlessly high inflation, which has come in the way of real consumption. So I think that's something which is going to get reflected in the fourth quarter too. And we have also seen that in terms of something like investment, the states have not been playing their role. They have been very conservative in terms of their capex spending. So most of the heavy lifting has been done by the center. And that's also going to sort of limit the kind of growth which you're going to see in overall capital formation. So put consumption and capital formation both together. I think the slowdown will continue in the fourth quarter too. Yeah, for Q4, we're looking at a number closer to 4.2%. That will bring down the overall growth rate to 7, 6.8% for the entire year. India's economy grew at a weaker than expected rate in Q3 FY23 as manufacturing output contracted for the second consecutive quarter and consumer demand slowed. Wide revisions were also made to earlier GDP data. Meanwhile, the NSO kept the FY23 growth forecast unchanged at 7%, implicitly assuming 5.1% growth in Q4 FY23. And finally, growth relative to the pre-COVID level rose applicably to 11.6% in Q3 FY23 from 9.4% in Q2 FY23, indicating an improved, albeit stubbornly uneven, economic recovery. Ashima Goel, one of the members of the RBI's rate setting panel, recently told Business Standard that a further tightening could bring down the GDP growth to 5%. Another MPC member, Jayant Varma, also had a similar view. Moving on, pandemic catapulted online transactions to a new high. But with it, causes of online frauds have also hit a new peak. Cyber criminals are now using various ways to cheat people. One of them is through fake websites. Co-founder of Mumbai-based audio company Boat recently took to Twitter to request customers to buy products from the original websites and not from the fake ones selling counterfeit products. So, how big is the fake website problem? Tushar Verma's report brings the answer. Over two years of pandemic accelerated the adoption of e-commerce in India and across the globe. But this grim period also saw a steep jump in cyber attacks and online frauds. In August last year, Delhi police had busted a pan-India racket which used to dupe people through fake e-commerce websites. The action came after Delhi High Court directed police to crack down on fake websites while hearing a petition filed by shopping website Misho, which alleged that some entities were duping its customer by using its name. But even as law enforcement agencies continue their crackdown, there seems to be no let-up in cases of online frauds. The Directorate General of Foreign Trade, which is a wing of the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, last month warned people against those mimicking its official website and email to dupe exporters and importers. 
The Central Board of Secondary Education or CBSE too recently released a warning cautioning 10th and 12th standard students. A website looking similar to CBSE's official website was duping students by asking them to pay for fake sample papers for the board exams. Fake websites cheat people by imitating the real ones. They almost look like the original websites, whether it is of the government or of an e-commerce website. So, what do the experts have to say? So, the issue of uh, fake websites is um, actually a serious problem, uh, and uh, it's increasing with the increasing usage of the internet. According to some estimates, uh, only up to 60 percent of uh, the content and users on the web on the web. or the internet are uh, actually genuine the remaining is uh, all fake india had reported 2 lakh 8000 cases of cyber attacks in 2018 it rose to 3 lakh 94000 in 2019 in 2020 it saw a sharp jump and rose to 11 lakh 58000 in 2021 it reached 14 lakhs cyber crimes increased almost 7 times in 3 years between 2018 and 2021 a large chunk of these cases are related to fake websites too so how do these fake websites operate in terms of functionality there are multiple ways uh, fake websites and uh, cyber frauds function you know the most common is the phishing attack so for example uh, you are banking with a particular indian bank say for, say in this case uh, hdfc uh, so you would actually when you look at the the domain or the web link it will appear as if it's a hdfc but one of the alphabets would be from another uh, instead of english it would be from a a different uh, um, you know script and it would still appear the same the website itself would appear completely genuine the national cyber crime reporting portal has been set up by the government to register complaints we also have a cyber response team called indian computer emergency response team or cert in Set up in 2004, this organization is being increasingly called to counter cyber crimes. Most recently, Cert in was roped in when a cyber attack brought services at Ames Delhi to a grinding halt. But what more needs to be done to curb the menace of fake websites and cyber fraud? The entire issue of fake websites is not being covered under the Indian Cyber Law, being the Information Technology Act 2000, as amended by the 2008 amendments. So. effectively when you are creating a fake website it's a different paradigm altogether technically whenever you create a fake website you can be booked for offence of forgery which has been done for the purposes of cheating but we are seeing that majority of the times the law enforcement agencies are not yet very willing to register cases under section 468 of the indian penal code so if you were supposed to have any direct cogent and effective provisions in this regard in the law that's going to help a parliamentary standing committee in its report last year had called for ramping up capabilities and resilience of the country to deal with imminent dangers in cyberspace the panel had also said that the efforts to boost cybersecurity should not face fund crunch but a recent report claimed that funds meant for cybersecurity have been underutilized as only rupees 98 crore were used out of the total 213 crore rupees sanctioned till december last year Experts also call for dedicated cyber crime courts saying that existing courts are already overloaded. Heading over to the stock markets, as cotton prices softened 41 percent from last year's high, analysts believe a silver lining may be emerging for the sector. That apart, they expect improved capacity utilizations, lowering of domestic cotton premium over international prices, and demand rebound to benefit the overall sector. Lavisha Dharad's report has more on it. from 50530 rupees per bale to 29910 
cotton prices have seen over 40% correction from last year's high. Global majors have also started returning to India's textile export hub Tirupur after a gap of several months. Knitwear exports from Tirupur rose 1.5% in dollar terms and 11.6% in rupee terms last month. The rise came after an average 20% drop in the past five months as the sector stormed through twin challenges of COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. Analysts now believe that unstable political scenarios in Sri Lanka and Pakistan and wage issues in Bangladesh will shift export demand from these economies to India. Moreover, free trade agreements with Australia, the UAE and UK will help Indian textile companies get a price edge in globally competitive environment. As the commodity prices are reverting to normal and the global distributors exhaust the inventories, Indian textile exporters are expected to witness strong demand in the coming years. In addition, the growing preference of global importers to move away a part of the sourcing from China to India due to the China Plus One is anticipated to provide additional business to the Indian textile industry. To counter the stiff competition from Vietnam and Bangladesh, which have the advantage of low-cost labor and favorable trade towns in many countries, India has recently signed an FTA with Australia and UAE to improve its textile trade. With such FTAs, Indian textile companies will get a price advantage due to zero import duties in their countries. That apart, after a muted performance in the October-December quarter, analysts believe that the correction in cotton prices would bring margin relief for textile companies. Spike in the cotton prices affected the profitability of textile companies for past three to four quarters. It not only affected the profitability but also had an impact on the export demand due to the competitive pricing pressure. Cotton prices have corrected by 38 to 40 percent from its all-time high and continues to be on a declining trend. This along with fall in the freight rates and availability of containers augur well for textile companies from profitability as well as demand perspective uh, in the uh, medium to long term. We expect margins of textile companies to gradually improve in the quarters ahead. Also decline in the cotton prices will help uh, the Indian players to become price competitive in the global markets. Uh, Those slowdown in the global markets will affect the export demand for uh, textile products including garments in the near term. We expect the same to improve by Q2 of FY 2024 with global retailers ordering for fresh inventory. For the signing of of FTA with UK will improve India's position in the global export market. Thus, long-term growth prospect uh, for textile uh, sector is intact. In the garment space, we prefer stocks such as SP apparels and KPR mills from medium to long-term perspective. Meanwhile, on the bourses, Though textile companies have exhibited mixed trends over the past one month, shares of Gokul Das Exports, KPR Mills, SP Apparel and Vardhaman Textiles have risen up to 15%. Overall, improved capex, softening cotton prices and demand recovery could turn the tide in favour of textile sector. As regards today, crude oil prices, global queues, rupee movement and foreign fund flow action will dominate market trends. That apart, December 2022 quarter GDP numbers released after market hours on Tuesday will also be on investors' minds before the opening bell. Meanwhile, in a good news for the industry, the government is planning to table the Jan Vishwas bill in the second phase of the parliament's budget session. The bill seeks to decriminalize 183 offenses across 42 central acts to ensure ease of doing business. We bring you more about the proposed amendment in our decoded segment. Sir, for enhancing ease of doing business, more than 39,000 compliance more than 39,000 compliances have been reduced and more than 3,400 legal provisions have been decriminalized. 
That was the finance minister Nirmala Sitharaman presenting her budget speech last month reiterating the government's emphasis on reforms and ease of doing business in the country. The proposed Jan Vishwas bill is a step in that direction. The bill with its compliance reforms and decriminalized legal provisions is a move towards the removal of outdated legislations amendment of regulations to change procedures and pronounced self regulation for businesses the jan vishwas bill is expected to be tabled in the parliament in the upcoming second budget session starting 13th march it was first introduced in the lok sabha by the minister of commerce and industry piyush goel in december last year The minister had then said that the amendments will enhance trust-based governance and promote ease of doing business. After its first introduction, the bill was sent to the Joint Parliamentary Committee for review. The bill spans across the union government covering as many as 19 ministries. The bill covers existing acts like the Indian Post Office Act of 1898, Environment Protection Act of 1986, Public Liability Insurance Act of 1991, the Information Technology Act of 2000 and more. Now take a look at the type of offences which will be decriminalized and what will be the new punishment presently disclosing personal information in breach of a lawful contract is punishable by imprisonment under the information technology act 2000 the imprisonment can be up to 3 years along with a fine of up to rupees 3 lakh the jan vishwas bill proposes to replace the punishment with a fine of up to rupees 25 lakhs A key aspect of the bill is decriminalizing imprisonment clauses in the laws with a monetary penalty. The penalty can be imposed via administrative mechanisms and will reduce the burden on courts. This move is expected to make the compliance process more efficient. However, of the 42 acts of parliament that the Jan Vishwas bill proposes to amend, around 23 of them are aimed at ease of doing business. The others are directed at institutional reforms. and to that end ease of living the 23 amendments make up only a fraction of the compliance universe of 678 laws likewise of the 186 compliances that the proposed bill decriminalizes 113 are aimed at ease of doing business according to an observer research foundation report that's also a small fraction of the 5239 imprisonment clauses that come under the ambit of the union government while the numbers are far from encouraging for india inc it's a step in the right direction i'm back by the nation's trusted bank sbi the banker to every indian the central government may appoint one or more adjudicating officers to determine the penalties that's all for today for more news and analysis please log in to business-standard.com if you like this video share it and subscribe to business standard for more news views and insights log on to www.business-standard.com do also follow us on youtube twitter facebook instagram telegram and linkedin